Welcome to the Quiverful Adoptions Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Casey. We are two adoptive mamas who have walked in your shoes, so we get it. We remember the crazy journey of adoption like it was yesterday, and we are so thankful we get to share some amazing stories with you right here from the living room of our office. Well, actually, we're sitting in the bathroom, but the living room does sound better. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, none of that matters. We're glad you're here. So grab a cup of coffee and join us as we dive right in. Hey, guys. Hey, friends. Thanks for joining us today. We're super excited. Elizabeth, I can't believe we're in the middle of the Promise Summit planning. I know, right? So we've been planning the panel. What is the panel? It is going to be awesome. So we've got um, all members of the triad will be represented for the panel. Please, if you think of questions for any of them, go check out the Promise Summit on Instagram. And we're starting to announce each of the panelists. Um, we're going to have three adoptive. Um, we're going to have three adoptive parents, three adoptees, adult adoptees, and three birth mothers represented. That's going to be so good. So, what is a triad? Heard you mention the triad. Yes, the adoption triad. The adoption triad is uh, made up of adoptees, birth parents, and adoptive families. And so whenever we talk about including the whole triad, um, we just want to make sure we're providing opportunities for each member of the triad to have a voice and have the opportunity to speak. It's just so important for us to provide opportunities where we can be listening to and providing places where and spaces where we can hear from all members of the triad. I love that. So everyone, you can go to www.thepromisesummit.com to purchase your tickets, or you can also go over to at the promise summit on Instagram to read more about our panel speakers and our keynote speakers. Yes. And early bird ends tomorrow night at midnight. So you have 24 hours, little over 24 hours to go purchase your early bird tickets before those prices go up. I can't wait to see everybody there. So, Elizabeth, go ahead and tell us, who are we talking with today? Today, we are talking to Emily Belknap. She is the owner of Bridgepoint Therapy, and she specializes in therapy for children, adolescents, and parents in adoptive and foster families, and therapy for children and teens to address anxiety, depression, grief and loss, post-traumatic stress, and family conflict. This is going to be a really good podcast Yes, I think especially for our families out there who have already adopted, um, it's just great to kind of put your ear um, to professionals out there that can speak to these kind of issues that they see on a day-to-day basis. But also for our hopeful adoptive families, because we talked a little bit about like protecting your marriage before you dive into adoption. Yep, that's going to be good. Hey guys. Hey friends. Emily, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Yes, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here and talking with you. Can you just go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in um, adoption therapy and counseling, what it is exactly that you do? Sure. Um, Well, I'm a therapist, and like you said, I specialize in working with children, adolescents, and adults in adoptive and foster families. And I've been doing uh, that work for about the past four years. Uh, And before that, I worked for a treatment foster care agency doing home studies and training foster and adoptive parents. Um, And then started my career over a decade ago doing policy work um, related to foster care and adoption. Uh, I just kind of fell into the, the field and really fell in love with the issues. So kind of built my career around adoption. That's awesome. And where are you located? My office is in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, Emily, over the last four years, we have seen many families, many adoptive families and hopeful adoptive families who have had affairs, divorces, maybe drifted apart during or after the adoption process. How can families safeguard their marriages from destruction, such as divorce, when going through something hard like adoption immediately following something painful like infertility or stillbirth or child death, infant loss? Well, this is such a broad question um, that I think it helps to start by recognizing that adoption for many people comes after loss, Um, you know, mainly infertility 
and having experienced one or even multiple miscarriages. Um, so you're starting the adoption process with pain and loss and the fact that it's probably not the first choice of what the parents expected or wanted. Um, and then on top of that grief, there's a lot of guilt and shame that comes with infertility or losing a child. Um, and shame, a lot of us know that that's a very uncomfortable feeling. Um, a lot would say it's probably the most uncomfortable feeling that a human could experience. Um, it's just that feeling that we're inadequate and unworthy in a deep and permanent way. Um, so getting back to your question, if you look at the research for women, at least, affairs generally occur because of an unmet emotional need. Um, so sometimes it's easier to emotionally pull away from a spouse than to force ourselves to really examine and talk through those feelings of grief and shame. Um, or maybe you're comparing your own grief to your spouse's and question, you know, like, why aren't they as sad as me or bitter about how well they're coping? Um, but really, there's no one one right way to grieve. Um, and so when those feelings come up, that's when you start pulling away and it creates this hole of this unmet emotional need. Um, so I think the most important safeguard really is just to let yourself experience those difficult feelings and then talk about them with someone, with your spouse, a friend, a therapist, um, but don't avoid thinking about them or feeling them. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar familiar with Brene Brown, uh, but she's a research professor in the yeah. field of social work. Yeah, and she's written several books on the topic of shame. And she says, you know, shame can't exist if you let it out and talk about it. And I completely agree um, that the most important thing with shame and similarly with grief is to let yourself feel and, and talk about it. Oh, that's really good. So with adoption after loss, so going back to like stillbirth, infertility, child death, infant loss, is there a recommended time frame that families should wait after such loss before pursuing adoption? Um, well, there's no set time period where, you know, you can count down the days on the calendar, like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> um, that grief really is a different journey for every person. Um, so everyone is going to have a different time period that's right for them. Um, for some, it might be a year. For others, it might be shorter, maybe longer. Um, but it's also about what you're doing during that period of waiting. So are you allowing yourself to really process the grief, you know, move through the losses and come to a place of acceptance um, so that you're emotionally in a place that you can move forward with it, with adoption? Mm -hmm. And the truth is some people aren't ever able to do this, um, or rather, let me say, the choices they make about how to handle their grief prevent them from getting to a place where they really are ready to move forward with adoption. Um, you know, the one thing that all members of the adoption triad, so the child, the birth parents, the adoptive parents, what they all have in common is loss. Um, and as adoptive parents, you're going to have to be able to help your child through their own losses. And it's going to be difficult or even impossible to do that if you haven't appropriately resolved your own. So would you say, Emily, that it's a good idea, say I'm a hopeful adoptive parent, a hopeful adoptive mom, and would you say that it would be a good idea just before we even enter into the adoption process to have a conversation with my spouse about, okay, where are we with, maybe we just walked through infertility Maybe we just walk through infant loss, whatever it is, but just to kind of have like that open conversation to say, are we really ready to embark in this before we even get started? Mm -hmm, definitely. Yeah, I think that's going to be so important um, or even connect with uh, someone, you know, maybe who you have a family friend who's gone through a similar journey. Um, there's a support group. There's someone at your church. Um, but to really have that that open conversation with them too, and maybe hear some of their experience and see if there's anything you can relate to or something that maybe it's hard for you to even bring up yourself, but if someone else brings it up, it feels safer to talk about it. Sometimes we see um, one spouse ready to move forward with adoption and the other spouse not quite there yet. What would you recommend the process be for couples like that? Mm -hmm. And and that's difficult because sometimes one spouse might 
never get to the the same place that that you're at. And I think really doing that, um, you know, the work with maybe someone who can speak to your marriage or help you openly communicate. I'm thinking of one couple that I worked with who it was actually the husband who really wanted to move forward. And the wife was hesitant saying, you know, we've adopted once, but our life is very comfortable. It's predictable. And she did not want to move forward. Um, And so when they came in, the work that we did together was the husband just wasn't hearing what the wife had to say. He kind of had his own dream and own vision and really wasn't stopping to empathize and understand her. Um, So it's just about helping them understand the other's perspective. Yeah, I think so many times when we, I'm just speaking from personal experience, when as an adoptive, hopeful adoptive parent, and you're ready to start the adoption process and you're you've got the home study done and, or maybe you're working on that or you've sent in the application to the agency and to like tell myself, like I need to stop, take pause and evaluate where we are emotionally as a family. Um, that just feels like one extra thing that's adding to the length of my wait to receive a child. And so I think that that is just something that has got to be a mind shift for adoptive families to see the importance of waiting and doing that proper work on the front, on the beginning, instead of waiting until the end or maybe the middle to realize maybe we jump into this too soon. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And, and some, some adults have been working at this for, you know, multiple years, even a decade or longer. And so they look at the time, you know, the money, the emotions that they've invested and they don't want to take a pause because, you know, this has kind of become a life goal or even a purpose that drives them. Right. And people are passing us by that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So kind of shifting gears and going into the trauma of an adopted child. um, Can we talk a little bit about primal wound and what is that? Yeah. So the primal wound is the idea that when an infant is separated from his or her biological mother, um, through, you know, usually through adoption, that it creates a primal wound, which leads to the adoptee thing, like a deep sense of loss, which looks like depression, a mistrust of others, which looks like anxiety, and then emotional or behavioral problems uh, that lead to difficulties in relationships with significant others. Um, so it's ultimately these feelings affect the adoptee's identity, self-esteem, and self-worth throughout their entire life. So how can people be sure that they're not confusing like ADHD symptoms as primal wound? Because a lot of what you just explained is what we see with my son who's been diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And that's such a difficult question to answer. Um, A lot of kids come to me diagnosed with ADHD. And I think sometimes professionals use that diagnosis as a catch-all for when they know, oh, there's something going on and this child needs some support, but they're not exactly sure what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, And in in my experience, considering that I work almost exclusively with adoptive and foster children, a lot of times the symptoms that are diagnosed as ADHD are actually anxiety. So for example, a child is having trouble concentrating because they're preoccupied with worries about their past or future, or the child is actually being hypervigilant, not hyperactive, because life for them hasn't always been safe and they've had to be on guard. Um, and this is true also for children adopted as infants at, you know, at birth or at just a couple months old, that they don't have the same sense of security and belonging in their family. So even if they haven't been through trauma or maltreatment, they can still have that same um, the, the same worries. Or even ODD, like oppositional defiant disorder, a, a lot of times kids will get diagnosed with that. But really what it is, it's PTSD or developmental trauma that keeps them from trusting adults or needing to have some sense of control in the relationships because so much of what has happened in their life, they haven't had control over. Or the adults in their life who were supposed to protect them didn't keep them safe. And 
and that can occur as an infant adoption too, right? Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. So what are some of the ways that we can prevent the trauma from getting out of control or ways that we can even help our child navigate through that trauma? And especially just, I mean, you can branch out on other adoption, but I would love to hear your point um, for adoptive families who have adopted infants specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I want to go back and talk a little bit more about what the primal wound looks like. Um, so what, I don't usually use that term when I'm working with clients. Um, how I talk about it is in terms of the loss, the insecurity in relationship and the challenges with identity specifically. Um, so there's really seven core issues that come out of the idea of the primal wound. And those are loss, rejection, distrust, fear of intimacy, guilt and shame, and control and identity. Um, and I don't want to say that every single person who is adopted struggles with these seven core issues, but I think a lot of adoptees do. Um, you know, or maybe some struggle as a middle schooler and they're able to work through these issues and it and it's not an issue for them for the the remainder of their life. And for some, these issues don't really surface until they're they're adults. Um, so for example, I'm working with a 17 year old now who was adopted at two months old and she was experiencing a lot of these same feelings. Um, but the problem for her is that her adoptive parents never brought up any, uh, any of these issues. They didn't bring up adoption a lot. They didn't talk about her birth parents. Um, and so when she tried to talk about it with them, they really invalidated her. They said, you know, we've been through difficult things in our life too. Uh, I mean, they, were, they weren't that harsh uh, in their delivery, but basically they weren't accepting that, that she had been through this trauma just merely being separated from her birth parents. Um, and so she really had to struggle to, to figure out, you know, how can I process this when my parents are saying, I don't even have a right to feel this way. I think probably because the adoptive parents are thinking in their mind, well, we've had you since you were two months old. You've been, you know, you've had this incredible life with us. There's no way you could experience, like, I don't know. They just don't see the validity of the trauma whenever she's lived with them since she was two months old. Mm -hmm. Or even sooner, like immediately out, out of, after delivery, immediately after delivery, the child has been handed to their adoptive parents. And so it's like, in because they create that instant bond, they, I feel like the adoptive families question this idea when it comes to infant adoption, question the idea of the primal wound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I see it time and time again, um, just this insecurity that my parents made a choice to have me join the family and they could easily make a choice to have me leave it. And so they live their life without fully feeling like they belong or fit in. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not rational, right? Um, But it it exists and we have to recognize it and give a name to it. So how can we help our children to where they're not feeling that way? So like, for example, my children, I have six-year-old twins and then a four-year-old and Elizabeth has a four-year-old and a a one-year-old. So how can we set them up now so that when they turn 17 or 18, they're not feeling like we're just going to kick them to the curb? Or even 12. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the best thing that adoptive parents can do is keep the topic of adoption and birth parents on the table. Um, You know, that you're bringing this up very frequently. You're reading books about adoption. um, You're hanging out with other adoptive families, kind of normalizing the experience. Um, and also that adoptive parents are educating themselves on these these feelings that are related to the primal wound. I often recommend that parents read the book, 20 Things Adopted Kids Wish Their Adoptive Parents Knew by Sherry Eldridge. Mm-hmm. Um, so Sherry was adopted as an infant herself, um, but wrote this book to help parents really understand the feelings of loss and shame and fear of abandonment. 
um, that are there that were there for her who was adopted as an infant and are there for so many other adoptees that she's uh, spoken to and connected with. Um, and so going back to the, the question, just parents bringing this up and saying, you know, it's okay that we talk about your birth parents. It's okay that we talk about adoption. It's okay that you have uncomfortable feelings about it. Um, Cause children aren't going to be the ones to raise these hard topics usually. So right. if, parents aren't the ones raising the topic, then kids get the message that either it's not okay for them to be thinking or feeling this way, or maybe my adoptive parents aren't able to handle my feelings about it, or it's going to bring up uncomfortable feelings in them, or maybe they'll get mad at me for, you know, even thinking about my birth parents, because I should just be grateful that I was adopted and be loyal to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's super scary, too, because of how, and this is something that we've talked about, you have to be very careful when you're talking about your child's story to them and allow them to um, create their own emotions around their story and so that we're not creating this positive idea that this is a good thing, that you were adopted, because that might not necessarily match up with all the emotions that they have surrounding their adoption. So is that something that you would agree with as well, Emily, as far as just letting them kind of gauge the emotion of their overall adoption story? Definitely. And also being aware that their feelings might change. Uh, I'm thinking of a 13-year-old that I worked with for a while. And when she first came in with her parents, her adoptive parents talked about how as a younger child, uh, so when she first entered elementary school, she was so proud of the fact that she was adopted and she'd introduce her first name and then immediately say, and I'm adopted. And it was just this pride that she had in that part of her identity. But then as she got to the end of elementary school and especially in middle school, really struggled with that being part of her story because she was understanding the losses that she went through and just the choices that were involved that impacted her life in such a significant way. She was understanding that at a different level intellectually and emotionally. And suddenly this part being adopted that she was so proud about now caused a lot of shame and insecurity. So recognizing that your child's feelings about their story can, can change over time. So it sounds like that family started out talking about adoption with her. Um, What do you think was the shift for her? So did they all of a sudden stop talking about it and stop normalizing it within their family? Or what happened to create that shift in that young girl? That family specifically, they tried not to talk about adoption a lot because um, they didn't want to highlight the differences. But I think even families that do an awesome job talking about adoption, you know, giving the children permission to feel however they feel, even those kids can sometimes have that same insecurity that I saw in that 13-year-old. It really is such an individual journey that it's hard to say, you know, if you do this, you'll avoid your child feeling that way because that, that's not going to be realistic. So are there anything, like I, I, I can sympathize with like our listeners that are sitting there thinking, okay, so this is something that I need to be aware of. Can you give them practical things to look for um, when considering trauma in their adopted children? Yeah, um, so just things to look for in terms of, is my child doing okay emotionally or are they struggling? Right. Um, yeah. So children either externalize behaviors, which can look like anger, aggression, acting out, um, or they internalize, which looks like them pulling back from their friends or or even family, a lot of worry, insecurity about their their abilities or relationships, or just a general lack of confidence. Um, So these are the common concerns that usually bring children to therapy with me. Um, And another thing that I see a lot of are sleep problems. And I think this is based on the fact that bedtime is a separation. And children either don't fully trust that you're going to be there in the morning. Um, I mean, they can know it intellectually, intellectually, but I think there's 
an emotional primal part of their brain that doesn't fully trust because life hasn't always been stable or secure, or they haven't, they don't have that biological connection. Um, or sometimes kids just try to avoid sleep because they have nightmares and that's scary for them. Um, and then another common thing that I see in the children that I work with is they put a lot of pressure on themselves, especially in school, that that's their way to prove their worth or avoid disappointing parents. Um, just this week, I've heard from two different clients about how disappointing their parents is the worst feeling for them. Um, so just imagine the level of insecurity that that they have in their family. Again, going back to that that thought that they have that my parents chose for me to enter the family and they could also choose for me to leave. And and I've heard this from kids and teens whose parents never joke about them leaving, you know, never threaten, well, you can leave if you want to, you know, parents who have never said that kids still come up with this fear on their own. That's hard to hear, honestly. Um, I mean, I know it's so true, you know, but I think that we just kind of, I know I kind of live in this bubble where I want my children to always be happy and right. love us. And yeah. Hard. And I think recognizing that it's not just kids who were adopted that can struggle emotionally, um, you know, and, and I have to remind myself because I work with the hardest cases, right? There's a lot of kids out there who were adopted and they don't need to see a counselor. They don't struggle with some of these hard feelings. So it's not every case. I want to, um, you know, not discourage parents, but also make them aware that sometimes we can be blind to things. So it's better to to educate yourselves and have these conversations with kids to try to identify if there are issues. Now, I know you mentioned earlier there that sometimes... Um, there, it's hard to s distinguish between ADD, ADHD, and trauma um, in children, or as far as like with anxiety in trauma, like that's how it's coming out. I'm trying to think how I'm trying to say this. <laughs> Hang on, let me start over. <laughs> so I know that earlier you mentioned um, that sometimes kids who have been labeled as ADHD or struggling with ADHD like behaviors can it could actually be the anxiety coming out because of the trauma. So how could we as parents differentiate trauma from just generalized bad behavior or an ADHD ODD type of diagnosis? That's something that both of our children you know struggle with. Um, they've both been diagnosed as ADHD. Um, and so we see that behavior. How can we make sure that we're not, you know, misdiagnosing it or um, <laughs> missing the trauma in their behaviors? Um, well, and that's hard because I've seen a lot of professionals miss it. So to ask a parent who probably hasn't been through years of clinical training to be able to differentiate, I think it's going to be very uh, very challenging because um, there's so many factors that go into it. So how old right. is your child? How long has your child been in your family? What's your child's history? Um, right. But I, I always encourage parents to stay curious instead of making assumptions about behavior, especially if that. the child's you know newer to your family, that what looks like manipulation or lying could really be a survival strategy that they were forced to use before. Um, or maybe the child just never had the chance to develop a conscience or has never had um, parents encourage these values and morals because instead they had to see adults making poor choices in order for them to survive. Um, but I also try to avoid using the word bad anytime I'm talking about a child's you know, behavior or just the child themselves going back to that idea that kids carry around so much shame. And so right. I encourage parents to be very specific that, you know, you made a poor choice when you did this, or you broke the rule when you did this, um, focusing on the actual behavior or action um, and not making a blanket statement about who they are as a person. 
is it possible that a child needs a therapist like you when they seem totally normal to us as parents? Um, and I guess that basically, is there a way that they could be just internalizing their thoughts and still be suffering from trauma when, you know, to us, it just, they seem completely normal. Is that something that, you know, is there a time where we ask that question of our kids or um, is there something that should alert us? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible for a child or adolescent to be struggling and not really showing a lot of signs that the parents could pick up on. Um, so I'd always encourage you to check in with your child's teacher or any other adults that are involved or connected with your family to help get insights and then talk directly to your child just to explore what feelings they're having. Um, a great resource that I like to recommend to families is the Center for Adoption Support and Education, which is based out of the Washington DC area. Um, that's the agency that I used to work for uh, before relocating here to Charleston. Um, but Case, they created a card game called 52 Ways to Talk About Adoption. And so it's a deck of cards and some of them, some of the cards have questions about, you know, what's your favorite thing to do for fun as a family? But a lot of the cards have questions that explore thoughts and feelings related to adoption or birth parents. Um, so it's a very low pressure way to start talking about adoption if you haven't been already and um, really trying to get at some of your child's feelings or, um, you know, how they're experiencing life really. Um, to help you get that insight. And then I always talk to parents for about 15 or 20 minutes on the phone before they come in, uh, just to kind of get to know the situation, what their concerns are about their child, and give some of my initial impressions to make sure I think counseling is necessary and is going to be helpful at this time. Um, but it's definitely better to err on the side of caution and connect to a therapist before things deteriorate to a point where, you know, your child's really in crisis or your relationship with your child has gotten to such a, a bad place where things, where there's a lot of hurt. Right. Yeah. So what is the best type of therapy for a child who has been adopted and may have some trauma related to their adoption? So the best type of therapy is going to be one that addresses grief and loss and attachment and identity. Um, so I encourage parents to avoid therapy that's strictly behavior based because it doesn't get at those core issues, like going back to some of the feelings we talked about related to the primal wound. Um, so you want to look for a therapist who's hopefully been through an adoption competence training. Um, for example, I went through the training for adoption competency that was created by CASE, the organization I used to work for. Um, but there's several other schools or organizations that have created their own curriculum. Um, and then also talk to the therapist to see if they have experience working with adoptive families. Um, sometimes therapists have their own biases or just a lack of knowledge. Uh, for example, I once heard a therapist say, oh, a child can't love his birth mother if he, if he has no memories of her, which is, of course, as we know, 100% false, but it could be really damaging for a child to hear that from a therapist. So, um, and then in addition to adoption competent trainings, there's also several other therapy models that I think are especially helpful for adoptive families. Um, so those include Daniel Hughes, uh, he wrote He's done a lot of writing on attachment-focused therapy, um, but his model is called dyadic developmental psychology. And then there's also TheraPlay or the ATTACH website. I'm not sure if you're familiar with ATTACH, the Association for Training on, a, on Trauma and Attachment in Children. Um, right, yeah. yeah, they have a directory of professionals on their website um, who specialize in adoption attachment trauma. Um, so those are a couple good good resources for families. Now, Emily, would you say overall, I know it's hard because there's specific cases and stuff, but would you say overall that this type of trauma, when we talk about like the primal wound, is that less likely to occur in um, adopted children who have a very open 
adoption relationship with their birth mother? I think, I think it's hard to say whether or not it's more or less common, but I think if those feelings do come up in an open adoption, it's a lot easier to work through them and address them. Because a lot of times children create this, you know, fantasy of wrong beliefs. You know, I was a bad baby and that's why my birth mom gave me up. Or, you know, I should have done more to to help her so she could have afforded to raise me. And so if there's an open adoption and there's communication with the birth parents, then the child's able to hear firsthand, you know, what was the reason for the adoption? Um, That's something that kids struggle with so much is that why. And so if they're able to, you know, to hear it, or if there's connection and the child sees, oh, my birth mother, you know, wants to know me or wants to see me, it really helps with that rejection and understanding. Emily, if a family doesn't live near you in South Carolina, but desperately needs a provider similar to you, how can they find one? Do you do like Skype counseling or do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, I do offer video counseling for older teens and adults. Um, A lot of what I use with children and younger adolescents is um, like writing or drawing activities and sitting on the couch reading therapeutic books together. So video wouldn't be appropriate for for younger kids. Um, But going back to the resources I, I mentioned about the attached website and adoption competent training directories, um, you know, really trying to find someone in your area using those resources. Um, Or I'm always happy to provide a a video consultation, you know, like a one session or or a few sessions if there's a specific issue that parents really are looking for some guidance on. Well, Emily, this has been incredible. Thank you so much for just joining in on this conversation and being a part of this podcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy I was able to be here. Have you heard about the Promise Summit? If you are out there and you're listening right now and you are hoping to adopt or you're an adoptive parent or you're struggling with infertility or maybe you feel called to adoption and you just have no clue where to start, then you need to be at the Promise Summit. Casey, tell us a little bit about what the Promise Summit is. The Promise Summit is a Christian conference for couples considering adoption, in the way of adoption, and or families who have adopted. This event is packed with powerful speakers, incredible worship, and a panel that represents all members of the adoption triad and is sure to be a weekend that you will never forget. Our hope is that you leave the Promise Summit forever changed and armed with the promises from God that will encourage you throughout your entire adoption journey. The Promise Summit will be held May 3rd and 4th in Greenville, South Carolina, and we would love to meet you there. You can find out more information at thepromisesummit.com or on Instagram at thepromisesummit.com.